if one is creating really good, interesting art on a consistent basis, then the next important step is you have to be able to communicate about that art. And here's where marketing comes in. And I break marketing into two pieces. The first piece I call programmatic marketing. And programmatic marketing is the marketing I think we're mostly used to in the arts, which is the marketing we do to get people to come to our performances, come to our exhibitions or galleries, come to our classes, et cetera. It's the brochures, email blasts, advertisements, direct mail pieces, et cetera, that we do to get people to our performances. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this kind of marketing today, except to say we do have a whole generation now of new products, online products, that make it so much easier to target our audience, to get to our audience, to give them a lot of information at virtually no cost. So this is one area we really do have an ability to reduce the costs of an arts organization on our programmatic side. But I want to focus today on a different kind of marketing. And it's a marketing that I call institutional marketing. And to me, this is a crucial prerequisite, along with good art, for, for fundraising. And institutional marketing is not marketing to get someone to buy tickets to next week's performance of Giselle. Institutional marketing is the marketing we do to get people to say, this is the most exciting organization I've ever seen in my life, and I want to be part of it. And let me give you two examples, one a larger organization and one a smaller organization. Um, about ways of doing institutional marketing. And I'm going to start with the larger organization. Um, I used to run Alvin Ailey, as I mentioned. And when I got there in 1991, we were virtually bankrupt. And people were sort of surprised. Why are we so bankrupt? Everyone knows Alvin Ailey. We perform around the US. We go around the world. We've been in England many times. Um, we're on television. We should be famous. Everyone, ev we are famous. Everyone knows who we are. We shouldn't have any problems. And then shortly after I arrived, the author Alex Haley died. Some of you will know Alex Haley is the author of the book Roots. You may have seen the miniseries on TV. Well, after Alex Haley died, we got thousands of letters of condolence because people thought that Alex Haley was Alvin Ailey. <laughs> and that told me, <laughs> it's true, that told me that we had a marketing problem, an image problem, <laughs> if people thought that we wrote Roots in our studios. So I embarked on a one-year concerted effort to convince people who we were and what we were about. And it started in December of 1992 when I got the company on a TV show called The Donahue Show, The Phil Donahue Show, which was a, was a big American talk show. He was the person before Oprah. Um, and my dancers danced, and my artistic director, Judith Jamison, spoke, and 18 million people saw that television show. Now, if that's all we had done, it would have had very little impact, except make us proud and our mothers proud. Because the truth about marketing is you have to say it and say it again and say it again and say it again. You can't just do one big thing and say, now we're famous. The next month, in January of 93, was President Clinton's first inauguration. And he was, not, he was elected in November of 92, and then was going to have his inauguration in January of 93. And I found out through one of my board members who was um, involved with the campaign that there was going to be a big gala the night before the inauguration. And I thought this would be great for us to be in this very visible gala. So I asked him who was running the, um, this inaugural performance, a man named Gary. And so I called up Gary and said, good news, Gary, Alvin Ailey's available, so we're going to be on your gala. And <laughs> Gary really wasn't interested in us because he had Michael Jackson and Barbara Streisand and Bill Cosby and Aretha Franklin and Fleetwood Mac and all these other very famous people, and he really wasn't interested in us. But he made the mistake of not saying no. <laughs> he said, well, I couldn't have you in the gala because you'd only have three minutes and there's nothing you can do in three minutes. That's all I needed to hear. So I ran back to my artistic director, Judith, and said, Judith, we can do the gala if we can find something we can do that's <coughs> credible in three minutes. Our biggest piece is called Revelations. There's a section at the end, a very upbeat section, which can be shortened to three minutes and still have a beginning, middle, and end. She said, we can do that. Called up D uh, Doug. Doug, um, great news. Um, <laughs> Gary, excuse me. Gary, great news. Um, we were on the gala. We had the three minutes. And Gary was very perplexed. He said, well, I would need the video tomorrow in costume, and you can't do that, so you can't be on the gala. 
So we went into the studios and put on the costumes and made the video. And it went back and forth, and eventually he had to put us on. And 88 million people saw that show. I also knew that at the very end there was going to be a big picture, that the picture at the end would be the new president standing on stage surrounded by all the artists, because there always is that kind of picture. So I told my dancers, all the other performers were in evening gowns or tuxedos, and I said to mine, who were the only ones in costume, recognizable costumes, I said, you worm your way to the front. They're going to stick you in the back, <laughs> but you worm your way to the front. And if you look online today, you'll see every picture was Bill Clinton and all of my artists in yellow dresses and <laughs> yellow costumes in front, and poor Michael Jackson and Barbara Streisand <laughs> stuck in the back. And that went in Time Magazine and every newspaper. That was in January. In March of 93, we did a big exhibition about the history of our organization at the Smithsonian Institution, a big set of museums in Washington. <coughs> I really love exhibitions. I would encourage all of you to think about doing exhibitions about your history, about your contributions to your community that show really the breadth of scope of what you've done and what you've contributed. This was an exhibition that we had already done in New York and it was an exhibition that really focused on the very humble roots of the Ailey organization and how it grew and developed over a 35-year period. This was our 35th anniversary season and so it was appropriate time to look back and take stock. Lots of people came, lots of press. It was a great thing for the organization. In July of 93, of 93, we did a big free concert in Central Park, which is the big park in the middle of New York City. It was our 35th year. I found a corporation that was celebrating its 35th year, and I went to them and said, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for you to sponsor this free performance so everyone in New York could come, and that'd be a, a relatively inexpensive way to celebrate your anniversary. They loved the idea. They funded this performance. 35,000 people came to the performance, and I set up a little viewing area for donors so they could see 35,000 everyday people loving the organization and rooting for the organization, which was great. And very importantly, CNN came and filmed a little section and ran it every half hour for 24 hours, or 48 times. We had a section on CNN for the next day, which was fantastic. In August of 93, the mayor of New York at the time, Mayor Giuliani, named our street Alvin Ailey Place. And to this day, if you go to West 61st Street, you'll see that West 61st Street in New York is Alvin Ailey Place, even though Alvin Ailey's moved and is no longer in West 61st Street. There was press about that and attention. In November of 93, two books were published about the organization. One was the autobiography of our artistic director, Judith Jamison. One was a book of photographs by a man named Jack Mitchell, who'd been photographing the organization virtually its whole history. So it was a whole history of the Ailey Company in photographs. And in December of 93 was our 35th anniversary season, which opened with a big gala performance with Maya Angelou, Jesse Norman, Anna Devere Smith, Denzel Washington, um, Al Jarreau, and Dionne Warwick, all performing with the company. Everywhere you turned around in that 12-month period, there was the Ailey Company doing something visible, exciting, and related to mission. None of this cost us a penny. The Donahue Show paid for the Donahue Show. The Clinton Inauguration paid for the uh, Clinton Inaugural. The Smithsonian paid for the exhibition. We found that corporate donor to pay for Central Park. The city paid for the street naming. The publishers paid for the two books. We did have to mount this performance, but we made money because we sold out and the tickets were expensive. Mm -hmm. Institutional marketing takes time and it takes a lot of creativity. It doesn't have to take a lot of money, but it has a very big impact. In 1992, before all this happened, our total private fundraising for the year was $1.7 million. In 1993, when all of this was going on, our private fundraising exactly doubled to $3.4 million. And it was not one big unsustainable gift. It was just lots and lots of people giving us lots and lots more money. So this became the base and every year built off of that. We, paid off the, we were bankrupt when we started this. We paid off the entire deficit in this one year. Why? Because so many people wanted to participate with the ALE organization. So many people wanted to be part of us. And what they really wanted was to be part of what I call the external family of the organization. And the family are your, 
I'm not talking about the internal family here. I'm not talking about staff and artists. And believe me, I know they're crucial. But I'm only talking here about the external family. Our ticket buyers, our subscribers, our volunteers, our board members, and our donors. So many people wanted to join the Ailey family in this year. And what, one of the reasons why was because of our board. And I know boards are in transition in this country. But when I got to Ailey in 1991, and we were virtually bankrupt, I, I had 36 board members, which I know is a lot of members for a board in your country, but I, I love bigger boards. We had 36 <coughs> board members when I got there, and I went to each of my board members saying, who do you know who can help us? I had a meeting with each one. And the astonishing thing was not one of my board members had ever met another human being. <laughs> they knew nobody. <laughs> now, two years later, when we're doing all of this institutional marketing, and they're so proud of the organization, we're, we're always being talked about. All of a sudden, they made hundreds and hundreds of friends that they wanted to bring in to the family. And I learned a lot about how to get a board involved in fundraising, which is we have to make them excited. We have to make them really feel proud of the organization. And the truth is, a lot of board members harbor a little embarrassment about their organization somewhere, about the financial health, about the art, about the theater being dirty, or the thank you letters having typos, or whatever it is. And my job running my organization is to make sure my board is extremely excited and proud and not embarrassed at all. Because when they do, they help me build my family. And when an arts organization has a big, happy, engaged family that keeps growing and creeps, keeps building, what they do is they produce money. And fundraising is the process by which the family is encouraged to give money. They also give money by buying tickets. But let's not forget that. That's crucial. When that money, and this is very important, when that money is not spent on new off carpeting for our offices or beautiful air conditioning systems or whatever, but when that money is poured back into really important, exciting art, and we market that art really well, the family gets larger, more engaged, happier. And they produce more money, which we can then put into more great art and market well. And we build a virtuous circle that really is what characterizes, in my experience, every truly long-term healthy arts organization. Really interesting art, really strong marketing, building a happy family, engaged family, growing family, which helps to create the resources to do the next set of art. It all starts from the art, though. And what's so frustrating to me is when I see arts organizations react to a cut in a grant from the Arts Council, or losing a big donor, or a production that's a disaster and no one came to see it, or whatever the financial bump is, one of the first things I see arts organizations doing is cutting the art, making the art less interesting, less risky, or less amount. And the problem is when you make the art less interesting, you put in process a vicious cycle. I'll give you an example. I used to run a ballet company in New York called American Ballet Theater, big ballet company. American Ballet Theater, seven, I joined in 1995, seven years before, had gone to England, to London, for a tour. And they didn't have a presenter. They presented themselves, and they lost a fortune. They didn't sell enough tickets. And so they came back to America with a lot of debt. And now it's time for their annual New York season. And they had to pick what to do, and they didn't have a lot of money. So they said, well, last year we did Romeo and Juliet. So we have the sets, we have the costumes, the dancers know it, the orchestra knows it. So let's do, um, let's do Romeo and Juliet again. It's cheaper. So they did the same work again. Less to market, because not much to talk about when it's the exact same thing you did the year before. Your family gets a little disengaged. You know, your ticket buyers say, a lot of them say, I'm not going to go back. I saw it last year. Some of your donors say, I have nothing to give to. It's not interesting. So you get a little less money. So the next year, what did American Ballet Theater do? What do you think? They did it again. <laughs> hmm? Seven years in a row. <laughs> That's when I got there. <laughs> After seven years, the family is disintegrated. Right? There's other things for people to get involved with. There are other ballet companies. There's other parts of life to get involved with. People don't have to stay in your family forever, and they don't, which is why we have to keep adding and keep diversifying and keep bringing new people in, because we're going to lose some of these people. 
And it's not just in America. I'll give you an English example. I got to the Royal Opera House in 1998, in November, and the Opera House was looking at a 20 million pound deficit. And the board in its wisdom did what? Canceled every performance for 18 months. The idea was, if we don't do anything, we won't incur any more debt. <laughs> hmm? But if you don't do anything, you're also going to have nothing to entice people to participate. So you can't get healthier either. Hmm? To me, this cycle is just absolutely central and crucial to understanding how arts organizations function, but the proper role of fundraising. And therefore, how do fundraisers belong? To me, what this cycle says, I promised I'd get here, <laughs> is we're not in silos. We're not the artists over here and the marketers over here and the fundraisers over here. No one ever likes the fundraisers because they dress better and have the nice lunches, you know. <laughs> but, but that's not what it is. It's about a cycle for a whole organization that works together, where people are actually actively communicating with each other about how this whole cycle is going to function. And the recognition that fundraisers cannot be successful if the art isn't wonderful and the marketing isn't strong. And I've seen so many fundraising people get fired from their jobs, being told, you didn't do a good enough job raising money, where it, the problem is not the fundraising person. The problem is that what has to come before just wasn't good enough, and that the organization wasn't functioning in this way. And the leadership for this has to come from the top of the organization. It cannot be forced by the fundraiser. The top of the organization has to say, all of this is important. We appreciate that this is the reason for being. So it's not that we're not understanding that this is our mission. But to make the mission consistently happen, we have to put in place a dialogue amongst all the constituencies in the organization that allows this cycle to function.